Stop loving pleasure. Stop pursuing the world rather than God. That is what James' message to us here is in chapter 4, verses 1 through 10, a warning against worldliness. My name is Jason Dexter, and my goal is to help you study and obey God's word one passage at a time. Today we are in James chapter 4. Let's go ahead and dive in and see what God's word will say to us today. James 4. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to make a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, He yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. So here we have two main sections from 1 through verse 4 is a warning against worldliness. And verses 5 through 10 are a reminder to be humble. Now here, once again, James uses the question-answer method to teach. His questions generally highlight the main point that he's going to focus on. He often brings up a question, raising an important issue, and then methodically answers his own rhetorical question. So he says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? The question implies that there were quarrels and conflicts among them. And now he's going to tell them why they had this problem. This quarrels and conflicts were an external manifestation of an internal problem. What is the problem that they had? He says, is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire, you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. In verse 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So what's their problem? In a word, worldliness. Worldliness. They love the world more than God. Now in the last chapter, in chapter 3, we looked at heavenly wisdom versus demonic wisdom wisdom. The person who claimed to be wise, but then followed the world's wisdom, seeking money, materials, and selfish gain. Now in this passage, we see another type of person who is not living out his faith. This is a person who claims to love God, but actually he loves the world more. These are the apostate within the church, perhaps a goat who thinks that he is a sheep. So the book of James is intensely practical. You believe God. You say that you have faith. Great. Show me. Where's the action? Where's the fruit? Where's the proof? And so in this book, there are many tests we can use to examine ourselves to see if we are real believers or not. In chapter 1, the test of trials. How do you respond when trials come? Do you persevere or fall away? The test of pure religion. Do you look after orphans and widows? Or do you just give to those who can give back to you? In chapter 2, the test of faith and works. Do you show your faith through your works? In chapter 3, the test of the tongue. Do you control your tongue and glorify God with your tongue? And then the test of heavenly and worldly wisdom. So now James talks about a worldly lifestyle. And the key problem is seen here in verse 1. Their passions, their passions, 
This is the worldly lifestyle. They were pursuing what they wanted, what they thought would make them happy, their pleasures. This doesn't refer to having fun, but it's a problem of loving worldly pleasures rather than God, being zealous to pursue those things in this world rather than pursuing God. Now, the English word hedonism comes from this Greek word. And some philosophers have used this word hedonism to depict their worldview for the meaning of life. What is a hedonist? A hedonist is a person that lives for pleasure. This is not a new concept. Certainly we have more new kinds of pleasure or enjoyment today, but pursuing pleasure is something people have always done. Solomon examined this lifestyle all the way back in Ecclesiastes 2. He says, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? So Solomon examined the question of pleasure. Can pleasure make you happy? Can pleasure bring you meaning and joy? And his conclusion is no, it cannot. Now, the love of pleasure is taking over many countries in the world. It's a large reason why the Roman Empire fell. At the beginning, people were hardworking. But then once the nation became rich, people became lazy and wasted away their days. A similar phenomenon is happening in many developed countries today. In many developing countries, people are very diligent and they work hard. And then once they reach a certain level of prosperity, they tend to become more lazy. So in developed countries, you have so many movie theaters, amusement parks, leisure spas, TVs in every home, personal computers with more TV and streaming options on them, handheld smartphones with even more entertainment options, always just a click away. Now these are just a few of the more normal or common forms of entertainment. There are some forms of entertainment or pleasure which are far, far worse and more directly sinful. So for many people, this love of pleasure is waging war on their bodies. They know they should work, but they cannot control their desires. These desires sometimes start off as something innocent, but left uncontrolled, they grow and they lead to fighting, quarreling, even murder. Here it says, you desire and do not have, so you murder. One of the most common causes of murder is quarrels or disputes about money. So the love of money, as, Tim, as Paul says in the book of 1 Timothy, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So how should we approach this question of pleasure? What's the proper outlet for our desires? The key is that instead of trying to fulfill these desires or passions on your own, in your own way, you go to God and you desire what he wants you to desire. Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. One example we can consider is the desire to get married. This can be a very good, normal, natural desire. But instead of letting this desire grow uncontrolled and then trying to fill it by yourself, you need to bring it to God. So you have two choices when you have the desire to get married, but God didn't open that door yet. You can go and seek after it on your own, your own way. Samson is an example of that. When he saw a beautiful woman, he just pursued her and it seems without thought of the consequences. He didn't ask God to provide for him. He didn't seek counsel from his parents. He just went and did what gave him pleasure. Many people are like that today. David was the same with Bathsheba. So this desire for marriage or relationship is a healthy one. 
but it could also become an unhealthy one if we allow this desire to take precedence over our relationship with God. And if we start to ignore God's commands in order to pursue that on our own. So we need to bring that desire to God. We need to pray to God and say, God, I want to get married. Please provide for me. But I will submit myself to you in this and I will wait for your timing even when it is difficult. That's a very difficult thing to do, to be patient and to wait for God's timing. Now notice also that James says, you do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So maybe some people say, I did take my desire to God and I even prayed to him about it, but he didn't do it. He didn't give it to me. Why not? James says that one possible answer to that question is maybe we're asking with wrong motives. For example, marriage. Maybe you're approaching marriage from a wrong perspective, thinking what can you get out of it rather than what you can give, thinking about what you need and what you want and the comfort and the financial security and the, the physical pleasure you are looking for rather than thinking about how you can love and nurture someone else. So maybe the mentality that we have is sometimes selfish. Maybe your motivation is pressure from others, family members saying you should get married or a financial motivation. Now marriage, of course, is not the only desire. There are many more. Money. Maybe you want money, so you ask God and he doesn't make you rich and then you're surprised. Well, perhaps you have wrong motives. Maybe you want to use that money for yourself rather than for God. Maybe your goal is just to buy a bigger house, a larger television, or go on a dream vacation. You see, many of our motives are purely self-centered. If you were to pray to God and ask for a car, would he give it to you? The answer is actually, it depends. If the car is good for you and helps you to fulfill the mission God has for you, then yes, he will provide it for you. But if you're asking for a selfish motivation and you don't actually need it, then maybe in fact he will not give that to you. So this does not mean that every time God does not answer our prayers immediately, it's our own motivations at fault. Maybe you've had the correct motivation asking to get married for decades and God hasn't provided that yet. That doesn't mean that your motivations are wrong. This passage means you should examine that, but in the end, God will answer prayers according to what is good for us, our character, and our relationship with him. So we need to learn to evaluate our hearts. Verse four says that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Why are friends of the world enemies of God? Jesus said you can only have one master, God or money. You cannot serve both. Now, the world system of thought is contrary to the Bible and righteous living. Some examples of worldly wisdom include look out for number one, live and let live, or even from the Lion King, Hakuna Matata, there are no worries and no tomorrow. You see, materialism, superstition, loose morals, and selfishness are all examples of worldly wisdom. For more on that, you can check out the last lesson on James 3, 13 through 18, which compared heavenly wisdom and demonic wisdom. This world is ruled by Satan and it's manipulated by him. He is behind it. Therefore, friendship with the world is hostility towards God. You cannot love God first and love the world first. We must love God first not this world. Now that doesn't mean that we actually hate the world. Uh, we know in John 3, 16, it says, for God so loved the world. So when it says, do not love the world, you say, wait a minute, do not love the world, but 
God loves this world, what does it mean? Well, 1 John 2, 15 through 17 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. So the world here is the world system, the system under Satan's control, the system which sets itself up in opposition to God. The same system that back at the city of Babel, people said, we will not obey God's command to spread throughout the world. We will stay here. We will build a tower in defiance of God. That is the world that we are not to love. When people say we're going to do things our own way in defiance of God. So verses 1 through 4 are a reminder to us, do not be worldly. So again, the book of James is a book about practically living out our faith. You believe in God? Good. Don't love this world. Put God first. Now, the second half of this passage deals with humility, and we can see that from verses 5 through verse 10. We'll start off reading verse 5. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? He yearns jealously. God is jealous. Well, there are many commands in the Bible for us not to be jealous. In James 3, it says, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. And also, Job 5.2 says, Surely vexation kills the fool, and jealousy slays the simple. These verses tell us jealousy doesn't seem to be a good thing. But then, Deuteronomy 4.24 says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. And again, back here in James 4, verse 5, we see that God is jealous. So is there a double standard? How can it be that God is jealous, and that is right, but people are not supposed to be jealous? Well, the answer is rather simple, actually. There are different kinds of jealousy. There is righteous jealousy and there is unrighteous jealousy. Or it could be described as rightful and unrightful jealousy. Now, let us think about it in this way. A husband and a wife make marriage vows to one another. But later, another guy comes in and starts flirting and spending time with the wife. He takes her to romantic dinners and he gives her gifts. Should the husband feel jealous? Indeed, he should. If the husband is apathetic and says, meh, whatever, it's a sign he doesn't love his wife. We would say, you're crazy, man. What's the matter with you? Someone's messing with your wife. You should feel something, right? You should win her back. He should zealously protect his wife's honor. He should zealously commit himself to preserving the marriage. Now, it's not only not good for him, for his wife, to be unfaithful, it's also not good for her, and it's not good for her relationship with God. The husband, the righteous husband, should seek to protect his wife from sin and to bring her back into the proper, healthy marriage relationship. Any man that tries to woo his wife away from him is bad news and will destroy her. In like manner, God is jealous when we pursue idols. God doesn't say, it doesn't matter. No, God cares. He wants us to be in that close, personal, healthy relationship with him. Now, an idol can be anything which you choose to set your heart on rather than God, like the worldliness we just looked at or love of pleasure. God's our creator. He has the rights to our affection. But at the same time, when we rebel against him, when we go astray, it's bad news for us. So God is both right to seek our attention and our focus, and he is protecting us when he does so. 
Now, would you want to be married to a spouse who doesn't care if you go out with others? I don't think so. Would you want to follow a God who doesn't care if you rebel against him and doesn't care that as a person who rebels against him, you will face eternity in hell? Would you want a God like that? Would you want to follow a God like that? I don't think so. Righteous jealousy is a good thing because it protects purity and holiness. Now, of course, not all jealousy is righteous. Sometimes jealousy is envious. In fact, normally for us, jealousy could portray itself as envy, specifically when we are jealous for something that doesn't belong to us. If someone is jealous for another man's wife and wants her attentions or affection, then that is sin. Now, verse 6 says, he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God uh, opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, because God is opposed to the, to the proud, but gives grace to the humble, we should humble ourselves. That's simple logic. You don't want to find yourself opposing the God of this, who created this universe. That's the worst possible situation that we could be in. God is king. He is creator. We should humble ourselves under his mighty hand. Not everyone does so. Psalms 2, 2 through 4. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. So you see, the kings of the earth are setting themselves against God in their pride. God laughs. Of course, he's not afraid of whatever plans or schemes they put together. Proverbs 16, 18 is also a very famous verse about pride. It says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So these are certain spiritual laws which God has established. And one of these is that pride goes before the fall. If a person exalts himself, then God will humble them. But on the other hand, if a person humbles himself, then God will exalt him. Now many do not learn this lesson. There are many people like the proud ones in Psalms chapter 2. They refuse to submit to God. They want their own way. They think they know better than God. So seeking after their pleasure, they refuse to submit themselves to any authority. Why? They say these authorities limit my freedom. I want to be free to pursue my own pleasure, my own enjoyment. So they indulge themselves. Now pride can manifest itself in many ways. I read a very great small pamphlet from Stuart Scott. It's called From Pride to Humility. And there are many uh, great things in this book. And he had many marks of a prideful person. I think 25 of them or 30. I would just share 10 with you very quickly. These are 10 marks of a prideful person. A lack of gratitude. Prideful people think they deserve what they get, so they are not grateful. Talking a lot. Prideful people have a lofty view of their own opinion, so they like to share it talking about themselves. Prideful people focus on themselves in conversation because they view themselves as more important than others. Therefore, they don't often ask questions or listen to other people. Anger. Pride and anger go hand in hand. The angry person is upset because his so-called rights have been violated. Prideful people have a high view of their own gifts and skills. They have a high view of themselves in general. Boasting. Prideful people find ways to exalt themselves in their speech. Belittling and criticizing others. Prideful people seek to lift themselves or exalt themselves up by putting others down. They make others feel small so that they can feel big. Unteachable. Prideful people don't like listening. They don't 
like to hear instruction or reproof. Why? They're never wrong. Lack of asking for forgiveness. Prideful people seldom admit their mistakes. They don't make many or any, right? Lack of biblical prayer. Prideful people rely on themselves, so they seldom pray. Again, these marks are from the book From Pride to Humility by Stuart Scott. Pride, it manifests itself in so many ways. What is true humility then? Now, a humble person is exactly the opposite of the above list. A humble person looks at himself through God's eyes and considers others better than himself. It's realizing that we are created. We are limited in our knowledge and power, and we are sinners in the need of a savior. It's not overvaluing ourselves or our own opinions. Now, at the same time, a humble person doesn't go around with a woe is me attitude or act pitiful all the time. A humble person doesn't go around and say, oh, I'm so bad and I'm a sinner and I'm terrible and my life is horrible. No, that's not humility at all. Why not? Well, a humble person is not focused on himself at all. A person who goes around always saying, woe is me, uh, I'm, I'm a wretch and so on, is focusing on themselves. But we are to focus on others and we are to focus on God. So humility doesn't mean we go around slumped over with bad posture and our eyes staring at the ground without any confidence. Humility does not mean weakness. Jesus was humble, but he wasn't weak. So let's think about some of those things mentioned about pride. Which of those characteristics are manifested in your own life? perhaps belittling others, perhaps talking too much about yourself and not asking questions of others, perhaps boasting or a lack of gratitude or a lack of asking forgiveness. Confess your pride to God and ask him to help you grow in those areas. Now, if there's anyone in your own family or friend circle whom you've acted pridefully towards, then go and confess. Because this verse says God gives grace to the humble. When you will humble yourself in front of them, then God is gracious. That relationship can be healed and improved. And your relationship to God will as well. Now verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Satan is looking for weak targets. He's not interested in going head to head with an emboldened saint depending on God. My children and I sometimes watch some documentaries. One of them is the BBC series called The Hunt. And in this series, there are different predators like tigers or orcas or wolves. And they are going after their prey. You know what they all have in common? Predators always try to sneak up on their prey. They attack the young the weak, and the sick, and they try to use the element of surprise. Whenever possible, they attack from the back. You will seldom see a lion straight on attacking a giraffe, a hippo, or an elephant that's fully prepared. In the same way, Satan likes to attack the weak, the unprepared, the unaware. So James' advice for you is simple. Resist. Resist. Fight. Don't give in to temptation. Identify the sources of temptation in your life and deal with them. Escape from them. Flee from them. Satan will attack the areas you are weak. You must resist. Do not simply give in and say, I always fall and I have no choice. There's no use in trying. No. God will empower you. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, There is always a way of escape that God has prepared. So when temptation comes, flee, quote scripture, pray, call your accountability partner, read the Bible, sing a praise song, tell somebody, develop a plan to resist, resist, and then turn to God for help and Satan will go on the run. 1 John 4.4 4 says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you 
is greater than he who is in the world. Your victory is not in yourself. We are little children, but our victory is in God. And God has given us the method of victory. Resist. And then in verse 8, draw near to God. Now, a lack of confession is one of the marks of pride mentioned above. God is opposed to the proud. Therefore, he's opposed to the person who refuses to admit his sin. Now, many of the mighty men and women of God in the Bible, they prayed amazing prayers of confession. In the book of Ezra, chapter 9, in Daniel, chapter 9, Nehemiah, David, they pray amazing prayers of confession, humbling themselves before God and seeking his forgiveness. God loves those kinds of prayers, and God is faithful to honor them. He was not interested in hearing the prayer of the Pharisee who says, I thank you that I'm not like these other people. He wanted to hear the prayer of the other one who would not raise his eyes to heaven and said, I am not worthy. We are not worthy. Let us draw near to him and admit it. And he promises to forgive those who humbly come to him and ask for it. And in verse 9, it says, Be wretched and mourn and weep. One of the marks of true confession is a mourning over sin. Sin should cause grief. It's not to be ignored, tolerated, or covered up. Now, the strong emotion of sorrow motivates a person to genuinely repent and make restitution where possible. Ezra demonstrated this morning in Ezra 9. He heard the news that people had intermarried with idol worshippers. So he rips out his hair. He collapses on the ground. And for an entire day, he lays on the ground weeping because of the sin. And then he comes to God with a mighty prayer, a great prayer of confession. Does your sin cause you grief? Too often we take God's forgiveness for granted. We mumble some quick, I'm sorry, and then we continue on with our lives. What does real grief over sin look like? What does real grief look like? That's what we need to consider. We need to mourn. We need to be sorrowful about our sin. And then verse 10, it says, Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. If we humble ourselves, then God will exalt us. Sometimes this happens on earth. Joseph, Daniel, and David were all exalted in this world to some extent after they humbled themselves. For others, it may never happen in, in the, on this side of heaven. Regardless, we know that God is watching us. We know that God is pleased when we humble ourselves. We know that sooner or later, he'll reward us for that. Now, God is the only one who truly has the power to exalt people because he has the highest position in the authority to say who is exalted. Now, this world may exalt certain people, such as Charles Darwin, such as Marx or Steve Jobs, but God has the final say. The world might lift someone up and then this person faces God and God says, no, you will not be exalted. You will be humbled. On the other hand, the world may scoff and mock certain people just as they did Jesus. And God says, he's the one I'm going to exalt and raise up. Now, Jesus blamed the Pharisees because they loved to exalt themselves. When they entered into the place of a banquet, they would immediately walk straight in to the top and most important seat, the seat of honor and sit there with their long, flowing robes. Jesus told them, no, you shouldn't do that. You should go to the lowest table. Then perhaps the waiter will come and ask you up to a more important seat. Now, Jesus is our most important example. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him. One day, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess Jesus as Lord. 
So don't worry about what do your friends say about you or what does your family say about you and try to make yourself look good in their eyes or compete with them to show that you are more successful than they are. No, God's opinion is the one that counts. Humble yourselves before him and he will exalt you. So as we come to the end of this study, I would invite you to make an application. Right after you finish this lesson, spend a few minutes and write down one way that you think God wants you to humble yourself in the coming week. How does God want you to be humble? And then also write down one way that you can sacrifice a pleasure that you sometimes pursue for the sake of following after God.